Hello again and welcome to Spotlight, the interview show on RT. I'm Al Grinov and today my guest is Nikolai Mladenov. Bulgaria is both an important hub for Russia's energy projects in the region and also an integral part of an ambitious NATO missile shield military project. All this puts Bulgarian diplomacy in the center of intensive diplomatic negotiations. To tell us about the results of negotiations in Moscow and also to explain Bulgaria's point of view on burning international issues, our guest on the show is Bulgaria's Foreign Minister Nikola Mladenov. Russia and NATO have failed to come to terms of the projected missile defense shield in Europe. Moscow is confused about who the alliance believes is a potential enemy, placing its warhead so close to Russian borders. Bulgaria, as other European countries, feels safe under NATO protection and supports the shield. Sofia strongly believes the proliferation of ballistic technology makes such protection vitally necessary. Hello, Mr. Bladenov. Welcome to the show. Very good to be here. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank it's, you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Well, first of all, I wanted to ask you about uh, your meeting, one of your recent meetings with Mr. Lavrov, Russian Foreign Minister, where you said, I quote, it's of paramount importance that our Balkan neighbors become part of the European security system. Well, obviously, you meant membership in NATO. Uh, if so... I also meant membership in the European Union. Okay, right. Uh, are you sure that, 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 that NATO is the main uh, factor that will guarantee uh, security in Europe? I, is, that, is that the belief? Uh, I'm absolutely positive. Because mm -hmm. if you look at um, things historically, you will see that the last uh, 20 years, um, in the Balkans we have seen so many wars and so many divisions among ethnic groups and religions, uh, that we have a historic opportunity, actually more than that, we have a historic responsibility to make sure that war will be impossible in the Balkans. And the way you make war impossible in the Balkans is by bringing in our neighbors in the Western Balkans into the European Union and NATO. That achieves two things, uh, two very important things. First, it provides for a common framework of laws and regulations to allow for the development of each society. Um, secondly, it builds on the community of values that Europe is uh, in terms of security. When you're allies, uh, together with everyone around you, uh, you don't fight, you don't uh, waste money, and you don't waste resources um, on um, protecting each, yourself against your neighbors. Uh, you actually invest your money and your resources uh, in tackling the contemporary challenges of uh, security that we have. And these challenges today are uh, quite different from the way they looked in the 19th century or the 20th century. Uh, the Russian foreign minister uh, voiced more than once the Russian position, Russian proposal uh, to create a pan-European system of security not centered in NATO. What's, uh, what's Sofia's uh, uh, opinion about, about the, the, this proposal? We looked very carefully at the proposal that came for Russia for a new security architecture, if I mm -hmm. might call it that. Yeah. Um, and I think it, the, there are many issues that still need to be discussed within the framework of the OSC. The OSC is the framework that gives um, um, the entire, that brings everyone together um, in a forum to discuss the security challenges that we face. Um, but our view is that the best way to guarantee security um, for all of us within NATO, Russia, each and every country, um, is that we engage on more practical, in practical ways in uh, involving our military establishments and involving our political establishments in daily interaction to protect ourselves from threats that emerge from outside of Europe and Russia and North America. Um, this, is a very, this is a very important approach to be much more practical in that sense. Um, but also to look at the existing structures that we have. Uh, there's a very good framework uh, within the NATO-Russia Council uh, in which we meet uh, often and we discuss uh, exactly these the issues. We discuss the challenge to our security. We discuss how we're going to work together in Afghanistan, where we face a major threat from the, uh, uh, from the Taliban and from for international terrorism, how we're going to tackle uh, the problem of piracy in Somalia, uh, all of these issues uh, that we can deal with. And I think this framework is a, 
is a very substantial one. We need to build on it. We don't need to start from scratch. We need to build on the existing institutions that we have. Moscow seems to be very nervous about the, the U.S.-initiated plans creating a missile shield in Europe. Uh, Bulgaria decided to take part in this program. Is this decision final, or is it still Of course it is. it is. Final. Of course it is, and it is a decision which is uh, not just in a national interest, but it's in the interest of the security um, of the Bulgarian citizens. Um, as we go forward with the development of a NATO ballistic missile defense system, um, it is of paramount importance to us that the entire territory of Bulgaria be covered by the system um, so that our citizens can feel protected from the threats that they emerge. What do you consider and these threat? threats? And these threats do not come from Russia. They come from a, uh, a number of factors, and they are common to both uh, Europe, NATO, and Russia. Mm -hmm. um, here, here's just a very quick list. We have a, uh, an international non-proliferation regime, which over the last 10 years has faced um, very stiff opposition and has, uh, in some parts, been weakened. This is a substantial international problem. Uh, today, ballistic missile technology is much more accessible uh, than 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and you have a number of radical groups um, and ideologies uh, that aim at acquiring such weapons. And this is, uh, this is the combination of these three factors. And if you add uh, a number of countries that are quite unstable, um, as we speak as well, uh, this threat becomes very important. So what is important for us within NATO and Russia is to find ways in which we can work together to jointly together protect ourselves against such a threat. Um, and some of the proposals that have been made is to start again with a very practical approach mm -hmm. on setting up a mechanism, setting up a center that would exchange information, that would build trust uh, between our military people, our political uh, leaders, so that when you have um, such a center which allows for the NATO uh, missile defense uh, system and the Russian missile defense system to exchange information and to develop in coordination. Um, and you back that up with the political will, which was very clear from the Lisbon summit, um, to work together. Then slowly but surely we will develop that cooperation and that trust um, that is vital. So I don't think that anyone in Russia should feel threatened uh, by the system. On the contrary, it provides us a, a wonderful and a practical opportunity to jointly work together against a common threat. Then uh, could you explain why, uh, why wasn't uh, Washington and also NATO countries happy about the Russian proposal to become part of that system? You remember uh, the Russians proposed using the Kabbalah station for tracking the missiles and so on. These are very complicated discussions because they always end up in a technical uh, debate that relates to military technology and all kinds of other uh, quite specific issues. Um, I think what is important is that there is the political will, which was stated both by NATO and by President Medvedev, that we uh, find the ways in which we can cooperate and we can coordinate in this, um, and, that, and that we now move to the next level of the, after the statement to find the modalities through which we can begin exchanging information and building the trust um, in this. I think this would be, uh, this is quite important. It is a very innovative project. If you think about it, uh, probably, you know, um, five years ago, ten years ago, uh, if somebody had come to you and said uh, NATO and Russia are thinking how to work together to protect the territories against uh, uh, ballistic missiles coming from uh, third countries, you would have probably laughed. Yeah, yeah I, I thought that was crazy, but, but, but today we, I still consider it to be crazy when somebody tells me that Russia may become part of some American military program, such as the Missile Shield, which still is an American program. Do you believe, do you really believe that Russia may become part of it? They don't want it, actually. Well, it's obvious. Well, you say that. <laughs> what I say is that, you know, there are a you number of opportunities. <laughs> there are a number of opportunities for NATO and for Russia to work together in protecting NATO and protecting Russia uh, by using our own systems um, against such a threat. Um, I don't see why people here are so skeptical of that. I do wish that, uh, you know, uh, people in Russia would be a little bit more understanding uh, of the fact that we are now partners 
uh, that there is a partnership that has been signed by NATO and Russia. There is a strategic relationship between the European Union um, and Russia. Um, and that one doesn't need to be uh, you know, suspicious of everything. One needs to be much more open-minded um, and to find a way through which we work together in a way that actually delivers to the, in, in the interests of our citizens. Because the citizens of Bulgaria, the citizens of Russia, the citizens of any country um, uh, in Europe uh, or in North America are basically the same. People want to live in security, they want to have their rights guaranteed, and they want to have economic opportunity. And when there are threats against, uh, uh, against these very basic uh, human desires, uh, we must stand up and protect ourselves against them. Well, uh, you, you uh, said that Russia obviously is not the uh, source of threat. Uh, and you also m mentioned the terrorist groups that want to acquire uh, weapons, but terrorist groups are n not firing ballistic missiles. Uh, can you be more specific on, on where do you consider uh, the threats coming from? Uh, do you know places where these uh, missiles that w would be shot over Bulgaria be fired from? I would be a little bit more careful if I were you with such an assessment, because 20 years ago, um, terrorists did not do many of the things which we now, now find to be common practice among some groups. Um, improvised explosive devices, very sophisticated improvised explosive devices, complicated and well-planned attacks on civilians aimed at disrupting uh, civilian infrastructure. Indeed, in Pakistan, recently we had uh, terrorists walk into a naval facility and do quite a lot of damage there. So uh, the world is changing and we need to be prepared not just for the threats of yesterday but for the threats of tomorrow. Um, and this is why developing such a system in concert with other things that we're doing, in concert with the dialogue that we have on identifying um, you know, the, 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 the core um, fundamental reasons why terrorist groups exist um, in the world, in addressing very fundamental um, ideolo ideological divisions that now try to um, explain the world as if collapsing in some form of clash of civilizations mm -hmm. and the clash of religions. All of this um, is fundamentally um, uh, a problem, an issue uh, that we must solve, and it doesn't matter whether that comes from Russia or whether it comes from, from NATO. Says Nikolai Mladenov, Bulgaria's foreign minister. Spotlight will be back shortly after we take a break, so stay where you are. Don't go. In 1982, Dr. Ralph Brinster at the University of Pennsylvania said, what if I can take the gene responsible for growth in human beings and put it into a mouse? One of the main risk issues of genetic engineering is that 95% of all competent scientists in these fields are working for the producer side, and only 5% are really genuinely independent. There's not a lot of science that says transgenic fish is unhealthy for people to consume, which is what the Food and Drug Administration looks at. There's a lot of concern about the environmental impacts. If a transgenic fish escapes, what kind of horrible impact will it have on the rest of the fish population? We don't know what this might do to us or our children or our children's children. In our Congress here in the United States, throughout legislatures throughout the world, we vote on all these different laws, tax laws and corporate laws. What could be more important than deciding on the permanent genetic future of life on Earth? The close-up team has been to the Volgograd region, the venue of the turning point of World War II. This time, RT goes to the region where half of the area is occupied by a nature preserve, where the young generation treads in their ancestors' steps, and where the mysterious city of the dead lies. Welcome to the Republic of North Ossetia, the Russia close-up on RT.
Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm Al Grunov, and just a reminder that my guest on the show today is Nikolai Mladenov, who is the Foreign Minister of Bulgaria. Uh, Mr. Mladenov, uh, Bulgaria was determined to contribute into another um, uh, big uh, program of NATO, which is the mission in Libya. Russia's Foreign Minister, Lavrov, was criticizing NATO's operation in Libya in its current form. He said, he said that it was not corresponding to the initial NATO resolution. Well, what does Bulgaria think about your participation in the Libya, in the Libya operation? And what's the final goal? Ousting Gaddafi or what? Do you actually see the final goal of the operation? Yes, I do. And I think, uh, first of all, let me start by saying that um, I think it's very unfortunate the way that uh, Colonel Gaddafi responded to the legitimate concerns and the legitimate demands that his, his people had for more democracy and for more participation in government and for more openness. Uh, the right way to respond to such uh, demands is to actually address the real concerns that people have, not to take the tanks into the streets, not to call your um, citizens rats, um, and not to attack them. And this is what happened uh, particularly uh, in Benghazi. And if it hadn't been for the very quick and very rapid reaction um, of some countries, members of NATO, of the uh, United Nations through the UN Security Council resolution um, and through the NATO operation, we would have seen a massacre uh, of unproportioned um, extent. Um, so I think that uh, the operation in Libya is right. It is legitimate because it's based on the um, uh, UN Security Council resolution um, and it is just because it protects the people from Libya. Now, you asked me about the final uh, how do we get out of it question. Uh, that question is very much a political question. Um, and I think the international community has laid very clearly what are the requirements, what are the uh, stepping stones towards reaching such an agreement. Um, and Bulgaria takes a very strong interest in Libya because we have a strong relationship with the people of Libya um, and we have many Bulgarian nationals who are in Libya. Um, what we, uh, our analysis shows very clearly that the political resolution uh, to the future of Libya must be based on a strong and very clear roadmap which brings people together from both east and west of the country uh, that unites the tribes of Libya, the different families, the different factions um, brings them together in a process which allows them to choose their own transitional authority. A transitional authority that uh, uh, will design a new constitution, will design a process leading up to an, uh, to an election. Of course, in this process, there is really no place for Colonel Gaddafi. Um, and I hope that uh, he will understand quite soon. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have understood until now uh, that the uh, further... Uh, you know, the, 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 the staying on, uh, continuing to stay in the position uh, that he has now is not just unattainable for him in the long run, but it is beginning to damage very much the Libyan people. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, we will see also um, an increased international effort to address the humanitarian situation, both on the side of the, uh, in, in, in places like Misurata, where it's very severe, um, but also increasingly um, in, in, in Tripoli as well. Uh, we hear more and more reports from our people on the ground of the difficult conditions that people uh, there face. Uh, Bulgaria has a, a naval asset and a naval blockade um, that exists. Um, and next week I'm traveling to the uh, contact group meeting in Abu Dhabi um, where we shall be discussing uh, further international effort uh, and I hope part of that discussion will focus also on how do we find a political solution to this crisis. Is it the same? I mean, your opinion about Libya. Uh, we, we talk about Libya, I mean about Syria. Syria, should the international community also so exert pressure on Bashar Assad to, 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 to stop violence against his own people, against the demonstrations? Uh, that's Are a, these situations the same as you see it? Uh, I, that's, that's a very complicated question because I generally don't think that we should look at the situation in the Middle East and, uh, without understanding the specifics of each country. Um, Syria is a very different country from Libya. Um, unfortunately, President Assad um, has not been able to push forward the reforms that he promised. 
Um, and what we have seen over the last few months is an increase in violence um, in Syria, which is completely unacceptable. And it is, it is uh, in the long run, it damages very, very seriously uh, Syrian, both Syrian society and the ability of Syria to come into a, a community of nations um, that would very much welcome it if it, had, if it uh, meets um, all international uh, standards and, 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 and good practices on this. I was in Damascus uh, a few weeks ago uh, and met with uh, President Assad. Um, we had a long discussion about the reforms that are needed and about the need to stop the violence. Unfortunately, I think we have, uh, the violence has gone so far and so deep into Syrian society that now uh, we're really in the last minutes or last days uh, of an opening uh, for political reform. Um, I understand that over the last few days uh, some uh, initiatives have been taken uh, to allow for an amnesty, to have a debate on the constitutional changes, um, and also to uh, open a dialogue with the uh, with uh, different opposition groups within Syria. Um, however, this is too little. Much, much more needs to be done, and it needs to be done very, very quickly. Minister, one of the most uh, important questions in Russian-Bulgarian uh, bilateral relations is, is cooperation, uh, economic cooperation and energy cooperation. In 2006, uh, the two countries signed an agreement to build a nuclear power plant in Belen. Is that how it's mm -hmm. pronounced? Belen, yeah? Right. Uh, well, however, construction has not started yet. Can you tell us the main reason, the main obstacles? Uh, why isn't the project starts cracking? Well, thank you for that question, but let me start uh, somewhere else because you said that these issues are, uh, energy is one of the most important issues in our relationship. And I agree with you, but it's not the only one. We have um, a very uh, good relationship with Russia and uh, part of my visit here um, was to try and uh, focus more of our discussions not just on energy and tourism but on a number of other areas where we can cooperate including culture um, and education. Um, as far as Berlin is concerned, Berlin is a very big project um, and it's quite a complicated project. Um, the way that the Bulgarian government approaches it is in a constructive manner to try and see to make sure that the uh, project itself, which was developed some time ago, the con as you said, the contract was signed in 2006, but it's an old project that goes back some 30 years, mm -hmm. that everything in the uh, project today meets the highest possible international standards and particularly European requirements on safety. Uh, you understand that after Fukushima, um, we're all very much more sensitive uh, towards, uh, towards safety. And I'm not saying that before Fukushima we were lax on it, uh, but the public itself is now very much more sensitive. Um, so what we're doing now is uh, our experts are working with Russian experts to make sure that the project is um, at, the, at the very, very top of safety requirements. Um, and we don't have any differences in that because neither Bulgaria nor Russia nor any other country would uh, be willing to jeopardize on safety. Um, and secondly, we're working on creating the, uh, the economic and the financial package uh, to make this project interesting uh, to outside investors as well because, it's a, as I said in the beginning, this is a very substantial project. Obviously, this takes time. Um, it doesn't happen quickly. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, it is in the interest of uh, both the Bulgarian energy companies, the Russian energy uh, company that is um, involved in it, both governments and everyone else in Europe, um, that we, uh, if we go ahead with this project, that we go ahead with it on the very, very firm basis that doesn't uh, leave any questions to be asked as far as safety, economic uh, benefit um, or financial uh, Packages. Well, people who take WikiLeaks seriously, mm -hmm. they say that one of the reasons uh, hampering this project may be that uh, the um, Americans were uh, uh, putting much pressure on Bulgaria, according to WikiLeaks, uh, to, to, to act in favor of uh, Western House uh, instead of Rosatom, American investors instead of Russian investors. Is that true? No, I, I'm not one of those people who take WikiLeaks <laughs> seriously. So if you want to talk about that, you better find somebody who takes it seriously. Maybe you have other sources of information. So, so. Uh, no, the, as I said, I think you know, all of these conspiracy theories and these discussions that have been uh, spurred by uh, leaks are, are very interesting and fascinating. Um, but the reality is that we're talking about a nuclear power facility. 
a nuclear power facility is a highly complicated um, um, facility that must, at, you know, at the very minimum, meet the top requirements in terms of safety that we now have. Um, and as I said, after Fukushima, people have been very sensitive to that. But you're not but abandoning the project to, like the Germans. Not, no, no, we're not abandoning nuclear energy, not at this point, definitely not. Um, you know, people are sensitive after Fukushima, but people in Bulgaria also remember Chernobyl. Um, and they remember the effects that that had. Um, and these effects still linger on. Um, in uh, many Bulgarian families, there are um, stories about how the government then, uh, the communist government then, uh, did not inform people of the risks that they were facing going out into the streets because of the clouds and, and, uh, and all of that. Um, and indeed, some people to consider that to be a very serious crime. So this is why uh, our society um, is, is very sensitive to these issues. So, you know, with all due respect to WikiLeaks, with all due respect to different types of reactors and producers, um, when you build something on your own territory, you want it to be top-notch. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. And just a reminder that my guest on the show today was Nikolai Mladenov, the Foreign Minister of Bulgaria. And that's it for now from all of us in Spotlight. We'll be back with more first-hand comments on what's going on in and outside Russia. Until then, stay on RT and take care.